Tim. <clears throat> also appreciate you coming clean about your days on the dark side. Thank you. Appreciate your comment on concrete pavements as well. So, and I know Austin in June can be awfully hot, but there's nothing better than an armadillo race in Austin in June. So. All right, our next speaker is Nick Davis. So Nick is from Troy, New York, graduating from SUNY Polytech in Utica, New York, with a bachelor's in civil engineering technologies. Nick has seven years of heavy highway experience with the New York State Department of Heavy Highway of Transportation, in which he managed concrete pavement, ride quality, and diamond grinding programs. Nick is passionate about investing, and as a taxpayer, has a strong desire to help municipalities optimize the life cycle cost of their heavy highway portfolio. He plans to do this by enlightening program managers to see the benefit of diversified investments of both asphalt and concrete pavements. We want to also congratulate Nick, who learned today that he passed the PE exam. Congratulations. Thank you for that. So, uh, as it was said, you know, I'm, I'm big into investing and optimizing our investment portfolios. Um, I was raised by a very uh, financially conscientious man. So for me, it always boils down to the money and, and spending it the best way. My dad calls it being frugal. Uh, my wife calls it being cheap. But the fact of the matter is a dollar saved is a, you know, a dollar earned or in this case, a dollar saved is a dollar reallocated somewhere else in our highway system. So uh, in terms of our topics of discussion today, I have an introductory video. It gives a, a great layout of diamond grinding, what it is and the benefits of it. Um, from there, I'll break it down uh, and talk about some of the particulars of the next generation concrete surfacing, um, pavement smoothness and its benefits, and uh, pavement, pavement noise associated with the texture of the pavement. But before I get there, I, I do want to ask, um, how many people in the room have heard of diamond grinding before? So we got, a, we got a pretty good crowd, a lot of experience with it. How about, uh, how many folks in the room are DOT representatives or design consultants? So we got a good number, number there too. All right, Rich, go ahead and play it for me. How tires interact with pavement can make a big difference. Think about how it feels to walk on a pliant surface like sand or on a bumpy surface. It's the same with vehicle tires. Pavements need to be smooth and stiff, otherwise they inhibit the tire's motion. This inhibition is often called rolling resistance. It takes energy for a vehicle to overcome rolling resistance, resulting in excess fuel consumption and excess greenhouse gas emissions. Researchers at the MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub have identified three main factors that can increase rolling resistance. Roughness, which refers to how bumpy or smooth the road is. Think large-scale imperfections, like cracks or potholes. Smaller-scale texture created by aggregates. Resistance caused by texture is also the measure of friction between the tire and the road. Deflection which refers to the bending of a pavement under the weight of a vehicle. Deflection happens when a road structure isn't stiff enough. This MIT video clip of a small-scale laboratory model illustrates the influence of deflection. Pavement designers need to provide structural stiffness and road owners need to make sure the pavement is maintained in a smooth condition over its lifetime. Stiffness will remain constant over the life of a concrete pavement. Maintenance that includes diamond grinding or resurfacing for asphalt improves smoothness and can significantly reduce excess fuel consumption. Concrete not only creates a stiffer roadway, but it stays smoother longer. Roughness increases faster on asphalt than on concrete, and asphalt will be rougher at 20 years old. Once it's rehabilitated, asphalt roughness can be reduced to baseline numbers. Concrete pavement experiences a much slower deterioration and can take decades to reach the same condition level. 
resurfacing has to be performed on asphalt pavement about every 10 years to keep roughness under control. And even then, it experiences periods of poor condition compared to concrete, which can be diamond ground every 25 years and remain fairly smooth. Concrete diamond grinding is often used to create the smoothest and safest pavements available today. Diamond grinding is the removal of a thin layer of hardened concrete pavement surface using a self-propelled machine outfitted with a series of closely spaced diamond saw blades mounted on a rotating shaft. Diamond grinding has been in use since the 1960s, with nearly 20 million square yards of pavement diamond ground each year in the U.S. alone. The most recent advancement in concrete pavement surface technology is the Next Generation Concrete Surface, or NGCS. NGCS was developed to meet the increasing demands of today's driving public, as well as those living in the vicinity of dense roadway traffic. It's a cost-effective, super-smooth concrete surface with low noise characteristics, making it an ideal, sustainable solution for urban interstates, arterials, and residential areas where resource conservation, safety, and comfort are of concern. NGCS pavements are created by first diamond grinding the surface. A flush grind eliminates positive texture elements created by dislodged aggregates and typical finishing operations. Grooves are then saw cut into the pavement creating a predominantly negative or downward facing texture. When traveling on an NGCS pavement, tires lock into the surface, providing better traction, while the grooves provide an escape route for water trapped between tires and the pavement. This minimizes the potential for hydroplaning while preserving the smoothness and safety of the ride. Furthermore, longitudinally grooved concrete surfaces cause the least tire distortion and tread compression. That is, indentations in the tire caused by transverse texture orientation are smaller and create less rolling resistance, making NGCS one of the most sustainable pavement surfaces currently available. Concrete pavements utilizing the NGCS require no compromise. They're safe, quiet, durable, low maintenance, and sustainable. For more information, visit IGGA.net. So this video is uh, on our YouTube channel, um, International Grooving and Grinding Association. So I encourage you to take it back to your office and look it up and, and share it with your friends and your constituents and your construction groups and your contractors and everybody. Um, because the more information gets out, the better roads we can build. Um, fun fact, I, I found a group of road enthusiasts on Facebook and I shared this video on that page and the first comment I got was someone needs to teach these guys at MIT about traction. Well, uh, diamond grinding and NGCS is uh, the primary texture for traction and friction. So we have that going for us. Um, oh. <clears throat> so the one thing I don't think that that video accurately displays is that the NGCS system is a three pass system. And with that, um, it means that we, we first want to do a bump grind of the highway section. And what you see here in the top uh, image is a uh, section of a profile from ProVal, which is a software used to evaluate ride quality. Um, and they have a diamond grinding simulator in there. So you can basically set your bar to you know 70 inches per mile is what your desired IRI is. And then you can run a simulated bump grind to achieve that. And it basically just removes the localized roughnesses. So that's basically what we're hoping to get with our first pass of a diamond grind in the NGCS system. We're hoping to basically get ourselves down to 70 inches per mile. We're using a traditional diamond grinding head in that pass. And, and, and that's basically our goal, is to get a pretty good pavement. The second pass of the NGCS is going to be using a different um, head. The, the spacing on the blades is tighter. It gives us a much smoother texture. Now the, the thing with this is we're trying to get down to about 35 to 40 inches per mile. In one of the next slides I'm going to talk about the, the difference in the spacing and you'll see that the, the blades are so much closer together that it's difficult to get water in between the blades and you can really tire those blades out. And that's why that first pass is important. If we have you know, 120 inches per mile and we use that tight stacked um, mil, I'm sorry, grinding head, 
we're going to basically expect too much of the blades and we're going to wear them out, you know, prematurely. And then, of course, the last pass is adding back in our macro texture and creating our negative um, surface area. So that's going to give us our drainage, that's going to give us better friction, and that's going to reduce the noise associated with the highway as vehicles traverse it. So to give you an idea, this is the spacing on a traditional diamond grinding um, head. You basically have 2.3 millimeters per blade, or in between the blades. Um, you're looking at about 57 blades per foot on, on that head. And as you can see on the right, this is a, a group of guys that are stacking a head. It's, it's exactly as the, the video had showed. It's basically a bunch of saw blades stacked together on a four foot long um, axle. On a next generation head, when we go through for our second pass and we have that tighter blade spacing, we're reducing that, um, that spacing significantly. You know, um, it's about a quarter of the distance in between each blade. So, I mean, we really only have like a couple of sheets of paper in between each, in between each blade there. So why should we grind? What's the benefit of having a smoother pavement? Well, for one, if we, have, uh, pave, if we have trucks going down our road and they're bouncing up and down, they're gonna be creating additional dynamic loads on our pavement. And that's gonna rapidly deteriorate the structure of the section. So we wanna prevent that. Of course, if you have less bumps and potholes, then you're not gonna be spilling your coffee on yourself on your way to work in the morning and you're not gonna be swerving into the other lane. So you're gonna be driving more safely. You're gonna have improved fuel economy because when you have a smoother pavement, the vehicle traverses the pavement more efficiently. Of course, you don't have to be in the highway industry in order to know if a pavement is smooth and we wanna reduce the number of complaints going into our DOT offices, right? That's the worst, especially, especially during election season when we get a lot of complaints about how bumpy our roads are. So we wanna create a happy consumer. And ultimately, if we're reducing the cost over the lifetime of our pavement, and we're increasing our fuel economy, and we're increasing the life of our pavements, and we're increasing the quality, then we're ultimately increasing the efficiency. So as the video had showed us, we have this diagram of different types of pavement, asphalt and concrete, and the rate at which they typically deteriorate. And the one thing that that doesn't show is an NGCS uh, section of pavement, which would really be much lower than a 70 inches per mile. You're looking to get down to 35 to 40 inches per mile. So if you do that early on in the life of the pavement and you have a good structure and you have a good surface, you really have the opportunity to have a, a surface texture that lives with that pavement for decades before it needs to be remediated. So dynamic loads in the roughman of the pavement, what we see here is the top line is a gray profile of uh, what, what a bump in a pavement would look like. So that bump is going to cause a vehicle to bounce, right, and have, have a rhythmic bounce to it as it goes down the rest of the pavement, and that's shown in the blue sec on, with the blue line there. And what you see is if we have a big bump, we're increasing our, our axle loads you know, by up to one and a half times because we're creating a vertical force as well as the weight of the vehicle. So if we, the point is, is if we have a smoother profile, we're reducing it and reducing the loads, the vertical loads, and keeping us in that 18 kit per axle wheelhouse. And that's ultimately the goal. The simple point is why take a beating if you don't have to, right? Let's, let's make our pavements last longer by ensuring they're not getting their butt kicked. Uh, Kentucky Interstate System <clears throat> did a project over the course of five years from 2007 until 2012 in which they did diamond grinding on all of their interstates, all of their concrete interstates, and they reduced their average IRI from 112 inches per mile to about 74.5 inches per mile. So, of course, that project took about five years. It, they had the lowest recorded IRI over a 536 mile section of highway. They were able to get the diamond grinding done for about $2.75 per square yard. Inflation's hit us a little bit. It might be a couple bucks you know, more expensive nowadays, but if you're gonna do 536 miles, you'll probably get a nice price. And the, the other thing is, is they told us that it was uh, about $188,000 per lane mile all in. 
that's a very cheap process for a, a highway um, organization or a DOT to spend per mile. Um, and at 275 per square yard, that's really only about $20,000 per lane mile. So I'm assuming they're getting that 188,000 per mile by including some full depth repairs, some partial depth repairs, some traffic control. So that's, that's their all in price. And they also determined that if they had waited for those pavement sections to fail and take them to the ultimate length of their life before remediating them, and they did a full depth reconstruction, it would have cost them 1.5 to $2.5 million per lane mile. So Kentucky has attributed diamond grinding to about a billion dollars in savings for their highway system. So again, are we being frugal or are we being cheap? And at the end of the day, does it even matter? The simple fact is we have found ourselves a billion dollars to use on other pavement sections and to try to get ahead. Every year we have less money to do more work. Well, we just found a billion dollars potentially over the course of five years. That's pretty significant. So as of a couple of weeks ago, we got this calculator. It's a spreadsheet from MIT, um, and, it, and it basically calculates the fuel economy associated with the IRI of a pavement. So I took a, a highway section that's close to my home up in Albany, New York, uh, where I-87 and I-90 meet. And it's a pretty heavy uh, traffic situation, 57,000 ADT, 17% trucks. And what they had there was they, they did a production diamond grind of the entire section. And before they did the diamond grinding, they had about 95 inches per mile. They had some slab curl that was built in. And, you know, so, so there, was, there was some issues that led them to have a newer pavement with 95 inches per mile. Not super desirable, but after doing the diamond grinding, they were able to get it down to about 40 inches per mile. And with that, I plugged it into my calculator, and I used $3.50 per gallon of gasoline and $5 per gallon of diesel, which I think are pretty fair numbers in today's market. And I found a savings of $82,000 per mile per year at the gas pump. Every year we're taking money from our taxpayers. When are we going to start giving something back to them? The annual carbon savings associated with that same section of highway is 104 metric tons per mile per year. Now, some people might say, well, I'm, I'm not super into carbon, but the reality is the federal government is super into carbon, so if you want to get more funding for your highway systems, you better consider it. And it's also going to be more important when we come back to some of the funding opportunities uh, later in the presentation. Why mitigate noise? Well, according to FHWA, highway noise is about 70 to 80 decibels um, when standing 50 feet from the highway. This can interrupt concentration, increase heart rate. So ultimately, it's going to have a physical and social impact on the people living in the vicinity of the highway. Uh, I got this other quote off of uh, some home building website that says that it's a requirement to have a home that has 55 decibels or less during the day within the living space and 45 decibels or less at night. Um, so ultimately, the, the point is, is it's desirable for us to maintain low or quieter pavements, right? And smooth pavements stay smooth longer, quiet pavements stay quiet longer. So we have two options. We can mitigate the noise or we can block the noise, right? Over the years, we've, we've always put up noise walls where highways are noisy. Noise wall costs about $3.9 million per mile. NGCS can reduce, I'm sorry, and the noise wall will reduce the noise by 5 to 10 decibels. NGCS can reduce the decibels by 15%, which is 10 to 12 decibels on average. So you, it's the same, if not better, and it costs less than $100,000 per lane mile. So even if I'm set up next to a three-lane-wide three pavement section, $300,000 per lane mile versus $3.9 million per mile. Saved ourselves a lot of money and put it somewhere else in our highway system. A couple of the bonus benefits of having a concrete pavement. Um, surface albedo, as you can see in that diagram, the asphalt section leading into the parking lot is about 125 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, whereas the concrete pavement itself is about 105 degrees. Not super important in places like Pennsylvania, 
Um, it, it has a big impact in places like Arizona and in Texas. You know, obviously, you have you have heat stroke from people walking down the sidewalk and things of that nature. And having you know uh, lighter pavements can help reduce the heat islands in the area. The other thing is the carbonation or carbon sequestration, in which the surface of the pavement can soak up some of the carbon out of the atmosphere. We don't have this feature with asphalt pavements. Um, the cool thing about diamond grinding is, you know, after a concrete pavement has been in service for a while, it does get stained, it does get dirty, so it starts to lose that surface albedo. It also starts to lose that surface carbonation effect. You know, in years one, zero through 10, it picks up about 6,200 pounds of carbon per lane mile versus years 10 through 20, 2,600 pounds of carbon per lane mile. Now, those are not significant numbers, to be honest. I'm not gonna go out and I'm not gonna grind a pavement just for the carbon sequestration. But if I'm out there and I'm doing the work for other reasons, this is just another benefit. So when we come back and we grind, we're reopening the pores of the concrete and allowing more carbon sequestration and resurfacing um, the pavement such that it has a lighter texture again so it has a better surface albedo. So why is diamond grinding such an effective tool? Well, it's environmentally conscious because with other treatments for highway work, you have to mine and you have to bring material to the job site. Let alone if you're milling, you have to remove material from the job site. With diamond grinding, you're simply going out there, you're taking a thin layer off of the section that exists and you're putting it in a tanker and you're trucking it off. So you're removing a minimal amount of material from the job site, but you're not bringing any material to the job site, which is a huge impact. The other thing is, is that, um, you know, again, s smooth pavement stays smooth longer, so it's much more cost effective than a full scale uh, replacement. And we can do it in a minimized traffic disruption situation. We can do one lane at a time. We could do possibly a rolling closure if we're going to do diamond grinding. You can't do that with every other technique. The other thing is, is if we only have one lane that has a ride quality issue and we have two lanes adjacent to it, we can just grind one lane. You can't do that same thing with an overlay. You, if you overlay one lane, you have to overlay all three lanes and maybe the shoulders as well. So what's the cost of diamond grinding? Well, of course these costs vary um, depending on where you are, depending on the hardness of the stone, the availability of contractors. But typically, we're looking at about three to five dollars per square yard. And that comes to about $28,000 per lane mile with a moderately hard stone and a decent sized job of about 100,000 square feet. So that's, there's nothing out there really that's gonna be cheaper than this. Flooring in your house costs about $3 a square foot. And we're talking about a heavy highway and we can do it for $3 a square yard. That's significant, that's cheap. NGCS grinding, $6 to $10. So we basically double the cost on that because we have to do the bump grind, then we have to do the tighter spaced head for the production grind, and then we have to come back and do the groove. So we're looking at about $65,000 per lane mile. So still, still relatively cheap. And what a great benefit that we can add to our, our consumers. So that same MIT calculator, um, you know, 57,000 AADT, 17% trucks, 95 inches to 40 inches per mile, cost of diamond grinding, $70,000 per lane mile. But we've already established that our cost of savings for our ga at the gas pump for our constituents is $67,000 per mile per year. So what if we could get the Federal Highway to pay for this work and then give it back to our taxpayers tenfold? Diamond grinding doesn't only last a year, it lasts at least 10 years. So diamond grinding looks like it is the only pavement treatment that's not only cost and carbon neutral, but cost and carbon negative, right? We're making money by diamond grinding and we're, we're taking carbon out of the environment by diamond grinding. And our alternative is an asphalt overlay. $100 per ton, $86,000 per lane mile. So in terms of cost, you know, let's, let's talk about a one inch overlay. In terms of cost, okay, it's a little bit more, but we're certainly not gonna get any of the carbon benefits. We're certainly trucking more materials to the site. So it, there, there is a lot of trade off there. And then the other thing is, is how long is the asphalt gonna last? 
AsphaltMagazine.com says that an asphalt overlay of concrete will last between 10 and 12 years if it's properly maintained. Well, this pavement right here isn't properly maintained. There's no crack ceiling. And all the joints have reflected right through the pavement. So after a few years, they're going to have to come back and mill it and, and fill it, right? One of the other benefits of... Uh, of concrete pavements as opposed to flexible pavements, as mentioned in the video, is that a more rigid pavement uh, allows vehicles to traverse the pavement section more uh, efficiently, particularly in low speed, high truck volume areas where you have a, a lot of load and they're moving very slowly crawling. And basically when you have that flexible pavement section, the vehicle feels like it's always kind of rolling uphill a little bit. So you get a better fuel economy just with the fact that it is a concrete pavement as opposed to an asphalt pavement. Um, if you were to put a, you know, a one-inch asphalt overlay on concrete, this is probably not going to have much of an impact at all. Um, but if you're putting you know, four or five or six inches on top of concrete, you are getting back into that area where you have this, this benefit lost. So the same section, MIT calculator, we have a second one. It's rigid pavement versus flexible pavement and the benefits there. And we're looking at about $160,000 per mile per year in cost savings when you have a rigid pavement side by side compared to a full depth asphalt pavement. 486 tons per mile per year of carbon savings. That is more, more savings than the, the IRI reduction. Now this is where we get into the funding part. <clears throat> So the bipartisan infrastructure law um, has some language in it, and, and I'm going to read you what's highlighted in yellow there. It says, develop a reduction strategy not later than two years after enactment. Carbon reduction, important for this money. Support efforts and identify projects and strategies to support the reduction of transportation emissions. Now, when Gavin was up on stage earlier, I asked him if... Uh, PennDOT had any plans to, you know, spend the bipartisan infrastructure law money, and that was uh, intentional. That was that was a that was a loaded question for me, um, and the reason is because with these calculators and these spreadsheets that I have, I think the way that this reads, we should be able to take projects, pick them out, put that calculator right on top, staple it to the top, get the federal government to pay for the work, and then, again, have it impact your communities tenfold in the pocket. So I think, all, I think that a good no amount of the money that is getting, we're getting from the bipartisan infrastructure law should be allocated to diamond grinding and its, and its benefits. And by the way, if there's a region out there or main office uh, for PennDOT is interested in looking at that calculator, I'd be happy to share it, and I'd be happy to help you guys chase the money. Because ultimately, I just got that calculator a couple of weeks ago, and I want to learn if this is going to work, if, if we're, this is money worth chasing, if we're going to be able to, to lock in some projects. And once one project locks in, more are going to follow suit. So I'm, I'm here as a resource to help you guys chase that funding if anyone's interested. So ultimately, our benefits, you know, we're going to mitigate our dynamic loads and improve the life of the pavement. We're going to diamond grind um, to remove small surface blemishes and increase the... Um, Efficiency of the pavement and the life of the pavement, reduce our joint spalls and our potholes. Full depth pavement repairs are expensive. They're expensive. Partial depth pavement repairs, less expensive. Not cheap, less expensive. Diamond grinding, cheap. Smooth pavements, cheap. Efficient. So diamond grinding makes pavement smoother, safer, and more quiet for the local vicinity. That's all I have. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, and that's it. Please visit me by my booth. I've only punched like three cards today, so I think that means I got a really good chance of winning the money. So come get your card punched or don't. Nick. Nicholas. Yes, sir. I have a question about the byproduct slurry of concrete diamond grinding. Is it affecting environmental uh, soil or water drainage? And how to dispose uh, wisely, you know, thinking about the environment. Great and question. what costs, additional costs to the department? It's a great question. So um, basically, what do we do with the slurry? So bad news is slurry as it comes off of the truck in the wet form 
is uh, considered hazardous material. Um, it can be trucked to quarries, it can be trucked to landfills and dis uh, disposed of. When it is dried out, it is basically the equivalent of agricultural lime. Um, the IGGA has done research projects and proved that it does not have a negative benefit to the environment around it, but um, you know, the DEC does have a concern about that product getting into waterways, um, so fair enough. Um, but the point being is the, the contractors in the game have experience getting rid of it. They will find a way to get rid of it. And the prices that I quoted you on the screen are, would probably cons, you know, include that. Um, you might have a couple bucks more per yard if they have a very difficult um, area to get rid of the material. Um, if you can broadcast it to the shoulder, some areas, uh, the DEC will allow the highway departments to discharge the slurry to the shoulder. And those scenarios are obviously the most cheap um, way of disposing of it. So, any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you.